Okay, <clears throat> well folks, uh, today is New Year Day, we say Happy New Year to everyone, all of our followers. And today we are at the home of Senator Abraham Darius DeLeon, Montserrat County. And specifically we are here to interview on the Senator's prospects and the year in review 2021. So Senator, you are welcome. To come to South Africa Live. Thank you, Komo. Let me say thank you to Frontage Africa uh, for consenting to do this one on one. Thank you. And let me say good morning, happy new year to Liberian home and abroad. Uh, a very happy, prosperous new year with renewed vigor, energy. And depending on God to order our steps. So, Senator, let's start by asking these few questions. 2021, what kind of year was it for you? A, a, a year now since you were re elected a senator for nine years. What can you say has been your challenges and success? Well, 2021 was a Challenging year as much as we have some processes. We want to first go give God the glory. Um, after we won the second election and entered into 2021, we entered there with our mind and our soul, with our character to do what we committed to do. Uh, knowing that we are human, we have we are human, we have our own imperfection like every other, other human being but um, when you look back at 2021 there are things to be thankful for there are things to to change do better there are some disappointment and regrets there are some self-inflicted issues and wound and but those things culminated together are lessons that we can learn as we enter into 2022. What is that one thing that <clears throat> if you had a chance to do differently, you would have done or you would do it that you did in 2021? You know, when you, when you put a pure bucket of water, pure bucket of water, and you take just a little dip coloring, any kind of coloring, and put in that pure bucket of water, it will dilute it. And it will hurt it so bad. So when I look back at 2021, of all of the things that we went through, that dip of coloring in the pure bucket of water was the issue of my ticket. Uh, that ticket issue and the way we handled it hurt me so bad and disappointed a lot of folks who believe in our word and our character it was simply to say yes it was courageous to say yes but i regret it and when i told a lie I realized that people who believe in me, some of the people who believe in me, believe that lie. And they defended and argued in defense of that lie because it came from me, they took it to be true. It is those people in my conscience and to God that are all even more the truth. It, in my view, it was grace and it was courage to come back and say no. That which I said was not true. I told a lie. I should not have done it. I am sorry. I can understand the backlashes that came from there. It's simply because this country, we are not used to public officials at my level to do wrong. Come back and admit that they did wrong and say they won't do it again. We are not used to it. Of course, you know, when you have opposition, you have opponents, they take advantage of every little slip. You know, and they blow it up and 
make it look like it is characteristic of you, you know. But you know, lying is not in my DNA. And that was for me my lowest moment. And I have overcome that. The reason I will always maybe talk about it because it is a reminder, not just to myself, but to all of us to be truthful at all times. Even if the truth is difficult to come by or to say, be truthful and we'll set you free. For me, 2021 was that moment that uh, when I look back on, I uh, refused to ever relive that again. You won uh, 2019 short lived and then came back 2020, you won over 1 million in Monserrado County. And some political analysts believe the number you acquired from that election is the first, which is arguable. But that is it right now. And the question is, I say this, one year into your nine years, do you believe you still have that base? You still have that, if, if we were to do elections again today, you would have such number of going to the school of business? What you see, your performance in office, I don't want to sound arrogant. I will continue to be humble. The people, some people who are disappointed, are disappointed because of the mismanagement and the lie I told about my people. Some people who are not politically happy with me now is because of my support for Joseph Walker against Mr. Comey. Not many people are disappointed in my performance as a senator. My performance as a senator, somebody that is not happy with me because I, they support communists and I don't support communists, I support workers. If you had election again, those persons, because of my performance in my of, in, in office, will vote me again. It, the sentimental political disappointment, I can understand. My performance as a senator has not dropped. And if you held election today, trust me, I will win more than the votes we got in 2020. In the last few days, with all of the low moments we had in 2021, you listen to the local radio station in Morocco in the last few days, Hot FM, Darius Dillon won the best senator of the year. Yesterday, D15 Radio, Darius Dillon won best senator of the year. Joy FM, Darius Dillon won best senator of the year. Even as the people express their displeasure and disappointment in our low moments of 2021, they still see that we are the best senator among the rest. And this is not arrogant. This, you cover the Capitol building. And I did not allow my low movement to impact my performance as a senator. So if we had election today, I will win again. How, how has, it, has it been <clears throat> going to the Senate um, with such vigor, such commitment, promises of, I mean, the quote-unquote, the, the light, and going amongst 28 or 29 others with different mindset, with different political interests? Have you managed to achieve some of the promises in terms of your work as lawmaker? You know, what the biggest promise I made to the people is that I will be the light. Some people took it literally. They thought I was talking about ordinary life, but we're speaking figuratively, that we will shine the light on the dark spot. What the first thing we sought to do was to open the center to the people. Openness, transparency, accountability, and it is a tough call when the place has been dark almost all along to switch the light on and catch people in the act. You know, when the place is dark almost forever, people who naked don't have time to wear clothes. People wish God, I would know that wish God fly in the night, people flying, people doing different, different things because. Nobody sees what anybody is doing, so everybody feels free to do what they're doing in the dark. 
The men who naked me get down the wear clothes. The one that gambling me get down. The one that do it them really funny killing. All that stuff. When you on and now, switch the light on. Even the men that were naked, they, who tell you to put the light on? Everybody call with me a sponsor. Dad. They don't want people to see me. Now, what am I saying? We entered the lesson later and we said we were open to lesson later for the people. Those things that are hidden will be uncovered. The people will know. And when the people know those things that are uncovered, when we put the light on, the people will determine what we should continue once they know or what we should drop once they now know. That's putting the light on. That's being the light. For instance, I said, anything we do in there, you will know once I'm there. Then you got to know about $30,000. Some people heard it first from my colleague, Senator Emmanuel Nupwe. And they say, oh, that was, they don't want the first to say it. They would have been right. But my presence made you to know because Nupwe and the rest of my colleagues said, it won't tell you that they don't stop talking. So you don't go talking. Nupwe and Edwin Snow and some of my colleagues have been in the legislature from 2006. These things have been in the budget. They have never said it to the public. They have never announced it to the public. But they say, what a need of hiding it now. When they don't open the door, the public will know. So let them tell the public. If you see it as a victory in a broader perspective than my presence, it's causing you, the public, to know what's happening in there. And when you now know what's happening in there, you either want us to continue, if it is good, or you get angry for us to adjust or change what is not good in your interest. That's being the light from a broader perspective. And we said we want to fight to reform the Liberian Senate, then it will transform into the House of Representatives, then the legislature can now start to reform. Because when you reform yourself and the institution where you are, then you now have the standing and the courage to fight for reform outside. What do we say we do? This voting, yay and nay, especially on critical issues, have to stop because People must be judged based on their performance. And how do you judge people's performance by history? It's when the record is there. Yea and nay is no record. So you realize that at the Liberian Senate, on critical issues, we are now voting by raising our hand. And as you follow the Senate, I am saying raising hand is an improvement, but it's not sufficient because if we voted raising hand on an issue, and you, for instance, in the media, took a picture of us raising our hand, voting on an issue, probably that is good for the country. The day the Senate voted on an issue that is not good for the country, somebody in the public or the media could use that one picture and say, yeah, all the people that voted for the bad deal. And they put your hand, and they put your picture up with your hand raised, now knew at the time you raised your hand, it was for something positive for the country. So I am now challenging and encouraging us to go beyond raising our hand by saying yes or no so it can be recorded on the record. For me, that small progress in a difficult terrain where reform was almost like a taboo to come back. We had one microphone in the Senate. Today, every senator on his or her desk has the microphone. The next thing we're seeking to fight to achieve is to have a digital uh, a system where when you vote, it can register through the system that you voted yes or no. That's reform. When we start to do that, and our record can show our performance to our people that elected us, trust me, it will help to change things for the better so that we can start to vote on positive things and constructively. And you know, so small, small reform coming to the Senate. We propose several bills. 
One of the things I realized in legislative working, especially being a senator, I had legislative experience being a staff. Chief of staff to the speaker, chief of staff to Senator Dwyer Howard Taylor. I had legislative experience. But being a senator broadened my experience even more. What do I mean? If you challenge almost everything, even if everything is not good, if you challenge your colleagues on everything and want to come across as a lone hero, there is a downside to that. Any bill you put on the floor, even if it is good for the country and even themselves, once it is attached to your name, they will vote down, they will vote it down. Just because you are not cooperating with some things that you view in your own principle and character that is not good. You understand? And so sometimes you got to do some balancing act so as to reach across the aisle to your colleague so that when you propose something that makes sense, good for the country, they can rally around. We propose the bill for us to make $5,000 a month in terms of salary. Of course, you know, it's a tough call for people to reduce the salary. But listen, as public officials at our level, we can say we won't save our people and it is sacrificed to the country and then our salary and benefit don't show that it is sacrificed. You, you got to miss something to prove that you're sacrificing for something. I put that bill on the floor. I'm only a little disappointed that you in the media and the public haven't brought pressure to bear on the legislature for that bill. Because when that bill passes, the country will be saved of about $4 million every year just from reduction in the salary of lawmakers. Once we reduce our salary, then we will have the authority by law to fix the salary of the president and people in the executive. The chief justice and people in the judiciary will we put all together to save this country just from high-ranking official salary, public official salary, we can save this country for $20 million every year. That is a bill that should be people-driven and of people's interest. When talk show host people, uh, newspaper editorials, and, and, and the public decide that this is not an issue to even talk about, so as to bring pressure to bear, then my colleagues will think that it is they don't alone want to do something. The public ain't get interest in nothing. The, the public think it is not beneficial to them. So they are not talking about it. So let's keep that bill in committee room. We will renew that bill in 2022. We put a bill on the floor for us to review the code of conduct to amend it so that when you put, when you declare your asset, you can also publish it by law. It can be mandatory that it must be published. What's the value of asset declaration to the public that is declared and deposited in a law book that makes it almost impossible for you in the media and the public to know what we public officials declare. It takes ethic, fear of God, and character to publish your asset voluntarily. I declared my asset two times before entering office on my two elections, and I published it. I went beyond the law to publish it. What is the value of asset declaration and even going beyond to publish? The value is it gives information as to what you have before entering public office. In fact, in fact, it is the first step to war fighting corruption in public service and bring it to bear integrity into public service. When you declare your asset and you publish it, it becomes open secret for people to know what you have before you enter office. When you are in office, the period you are in office and you started to and you start to gain new acquisitions, then the public can do what we call lifestyle audit on you. The public can start to now 
determine whether your new acquisition can match your legal earning. If they can match your legal earning, it smells something like corruption. You understand? That room enough, that ground enough for the LACC to come after you. If the LACC had the ball and not selected to go after everybody who entered government who almost nothing, and within short period of time, your left start to change, and your left that changing, your legal earnings don't match it. So we ask through a bill on the floor for us to amend the code of conduct to make it mandatory to publish your asset after declaration and to make it punishable by law, perjury, if you either honor declare or honor or overstated your asset for whatever reason. That's lying on our own and you should be uh, uh, um, prosecuted. We also put, uh, put a bill on the floor to enact into law the institution we call the National Food Assistance Authority. Not many people say, probably know the, the essence of that institution. That institution was brought into existence by, by a, 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 an executive order in the mid-70s but the vision of the government at the time that we needed an institution that would be responsible to do full distribution and other related items either donated by the government or by friendly nations. At the time, government was feeding public schools and we had friendly donations from friendly government to the government of Liberia. You needed an institution with the technical capacity and know-how to do this, this distribution. And from time to time, this institution has been in existence by renewal of executive order, including Honor President Weir. If we have had that institution enacted into law, standing focused in with the technical capacity and capacitated by budgetary support, that institution will have been the government arm ready to do full distribution of the stimulus package when we did the COVID-19 stimulus package. We wouldn't have the war food program coming in to do food distribution and time to ask for accountability. Then war food program says it is an in international institution that is not subject to the jurisdiction of Liberia, so you can audit it. But it is the government of Liberia money, it is the people's money that World Food Program was given to do the food distribution. And time to do accountability, World Food Program said, we are not subject to your, uh, to your jurisdiction, to your law. But if we had our own national institution equipped to do that function, then we can order them under our law. So we put a bill on the floor so that that institution can be enacted by law so you can have this autonomy by law and protect your existence as you dream. And there are other bills to put on the floor uh, uh, for reform. And, you know, so, for me, I'm all about reform. One will reform the systems so that people and our actions and activities and our conduct can be done and channeled through systems that can be readily audited. For people to be held accountable, we start to see some change. I know you spoke about uh, building relationship in the Senate or the legislature with the Senate. And the, uh, do you believe your openness, when I say openness, your action to expose some of or to disclose some of these monies that were given to lawmakers has somehow injured your popularity or your relationship with your base because we've witnessed that most often whenever you come out to announce some of this money and the public say take it don't take it <laughs> and it become a debate and, right. when, and when you make a decision to accept then the public feel you have i mean right betray them right is, yes. it, is it helping or is it harming you i think it's helping because look, in order for to, for to change the system i have always said and anytime you guys say this in the media or in the public, attribute it to me. We are used to doing the wrong things in this country and we're used to doing things the wrong way. So doing the wrong things and doing things the wrong way have been accepted 
a normal life in the country. Doing things the right way seem to be abnormal and rejected. It will take courage for us to get used to doing the right thing. And it will take boldness to stand up to do the right thing. Even with our imperfection, we will slip, we will fall down, we can remain on the ground, we got to get up, we got to brush it off and continue going because our motive, our motive, our desire is to see change and real change. So yes, when the people ain't used to certain things, when they don't have the proper information on certain things, there's a tendency for them to either get sentimentally angry, there's a tendency for them to get disappointed or feel disappointed because they ain't used to it. They haven't heard it before. And the explanation doesn't cut it. You will expect that the people will get angry. You will expect that the people will express their disappointment. And people will support you when they think you have done something wrong. They are justified to get angry or disappointed until you can properly explain to them. You think, I don't know that announcing what we receive in the legislature with particular reference to the Liberian Senate. You think, I don't know that it even angers even so my colleague. I know that because every time you announce this package, there's a tendency for more people to be at your door stand or at your office making personal requests. I don't want people to be making personal requests of me because I'm a public official. We want our service to take more people from our doorsteps begging and let them benefit from the resources of the country through the system. When we restructure the system, we reform the system and support the system, then the people who come to beg us, our citizens, who would think it is a proud thing to see them beg us, we will not empower them, we will make them live with dignity. Because when a man is not begging, he lives with dignity. When the citizens are benefiting through the structure, through the system, they tend to appreciate the system and the government more. And then you, the public official, attempting or intend to corrupt that system that will, that will not benefit the people, they will, vent, they will take their anger at you. If they are paying your school fees, you will praise me. If the system is paying your school fees, or, or you're getting health benefits through the system, if I want to corrupt that system that will impact your benefit in a negative way, you will deal with me. So we want the system to be built in a way that the people will appreciate the system and the government and the country, rather than appreciating us that corrupting the system and hurting them and taking away their dignity. So yes, I know. Some of my colleagues are not happy. And if they are not happy, if anyone is not happy with me because we want to expose a system for change, so be it. On that one, I have no regret and I won't back down. For proper education, proper information to the public, to our supporters, so they don't think we are involved and doing the wrong thing, we we'll owe it to them. And when the people who employ you with their votes are not happy with what you're doing, change it. You know, there's a ruling, a popular ruling of the Supreme Court. It says, when a law is bad or deemed to be bad, ask your representative that made that bad law to change the bad law. If your representative refuse to change the bar law, then change your representative to replace them with good representatives that will change the bar law. You understand? If our people have the right to tell us what to do for their own benefit. Most times, and I don't portray here to be better than any of my colleagues, most times it pains me. When I hear public officials, whether from the legislature or especially from the legislature, say, Dylan, don't mind no people outside there. 
It pains me, you know why? Samuel 12, McGill or any cabinet minister will never say that to the president. You know why? They serve at the pleasure of the president. They do any and everything to please the president. Who should we be pleasing? At whose wealth and pleasure we serve with any job? It is the people. So when the people express displeasure over certain things, sometimes people dis express their displeasure over certain things when they don't understand that thing or they don't appreciate it. When they don't understand it and they express their displeasure, explain it to them. Endeavor to explain it to them. When it is bad, after you explain and they still think it is not good, it is their will and pleasure you say, change it. Then that makes you a good leader. You are not serving yourself. You, are not, you, you really employ yourself when you are elected. It is the people that employ you. They are your employers. You are their employee. You understand? So my, my key focus is always to please the will and pleasure of my employers. I may not always get it right, but I endeavor to try. Say that <clears throat> one year ago, I mean, besides the short term. And we also did the dual citizenship bill. For all the. But at some point, you. you no, I didn't withdraw it. For all the political reasons in the world, that bill is stuck in committee room. I can understand. So I said, hey, if because it is Dillon who submitted that bill, and if it passes, it will be about it was Dillon whose bill passed, and we are enjoying our citizens, are enjoying dual citizenship today. Somebody bring another bill that enhances dual, embraces dual citizenship. I will be the first to vote for it because I want dual citizenship for our people. Thankfully, Akaros Gray put up a bill, similar bill, similar warnings, everything. Akaros Bill put up that bill. That bill was not crafted by me. It was crafted by Liberians in the diaspora and I was their conduit. Liberians in the diaspora supported me and still do support me hugely and it is their aspiration and their pleasure and their desire that will serve both home and abroad and so once one, they put that bill together and saw me as a conduit i had to yield because i also want dual citizenship for our people and our country and that bill got stuck in committee room and a carol grape put similar bill almost the same bill on the floor in the house and it passed it is before the house of Rebbe, the house the senate i'm a member of the judiciary committee to which the bill has been referred my vote is yes when the bill the engrossed bill from the house came on the floor i made the motion for the liberal senate to accept the bill receive it accept it and have the liberal the judiciary committee of which i am a member to review the bill and bring it back to plenary for action. And it is one of the priorities we're going to put immediately when we return in January. So it is not about who gets the credit. Let it just be done so long it benefits the country. So yeah, that dual citizenship bill is also there. And there are other oversight things with it. Oversight responsibility. You see? And we can't even get it. Uh this thing with the APM senior. I was just coming to it. Yeah, it is, the people people believe they didn't do the job and uh, possibly the job because some of the employees still are still not. And that's a point. Working. That's a point I was just supposed to make. Come on, all of us have a duty here. You see, sometimes I can be too long in answering some questions. My gift, I want to believe, is my way of breaking things down for the understanding of the people I represent. That is why I make analogies when I'm responding to some questions. You see, in the court system, especially in democracies everywhere around the world, the courts, 
the Maestiva court had court officers they call bailiffs. The circuit court has court officers they call the sheriffs. The Supreme Court has court officers they call the marshal. They are not present, but they are not many. When the Maestiva court or the circuit court or the Supreme Court issue an instruction for enforcement, the court officers, either the bailiff or the sheriff or the marshal, one or two of them go to execute the court instruction. If, for instance, if an entire community of people is to be evicted from a community, two or three court officers go to enforce that court instruction on a whole community of people. When there's respect for rule of law, two or three court officers can enforce a court judgment on a whole community without incident. When there's resistance because of disrespect for rule of law or for whatever reason, then the court invites police presence to aid the court officers in the execution of the court decision. Then when you see court officers, riot police, come in plentiful to stand by to aid the court officers in the enforcement of the court judgment. What am I relating this to? When a lawmaker, a few lawmakers, not in majority, uh, um, venture into taking up issues that would benefit the public, that lawmaker, although few here for the lawmaker, represent the court officers to enforce the court decision for public good. When the majority are resisting, the media and the public become the police. Civil society, the media, the people, they now become the police to come and aid those few lawmakers that are fighting for public good. How does that happen? When the media when the media takes a bill like five thousand dollars for lawmakers to make five thousand and make it a topical issue every day, when civil society start to issue statements every day in support, when the people start to call in on the federal radio stations demanding or calling on the lawmakers to support Dallas Dillon bill or what are that same bill came for another lawmaker, that pressure coming to bear. That you being the police officer aiding the court officer to enforce the court decision. You now support that one of very few lawmakers that are propounding positive things for positive good. When one lawmaker said Darrell Dillon put a bill on the floor and you in the media don't hold it, the public don't make it a topical issue with righteous anger then the message they send to majority of the colleagues is that that was the law is alone or that one lawmaker who submitted that bill even though for public good is alone because even the public get interested in it when you in the media and the public think that for instance let's talk about that was the law ticket for 10 months and leave five thousand dollar bill and leave code of conduct bill amendment and leave dual citizenship bill and leave other reform issues and other or, or oversight uh, 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 advocacy and leave it and don't talk about it, then you give a signal to the majority that you in the media don't have time for what the few are fighting for. We wrote the Liberian Senate calling on the Ministry of Education to do its job. One of its job to the people is to ensure that school fees, tuition and other school-related fees are not high and they are regulated without justification. My letter invited through the Senate the Minister of Education. He came along with his team of uh, administrators from the Minister of Education. You in the media were at the plenary. The Liberian Senate grilled the minister. The minister uh, uh, conceded 
that they weren't doing their job in regulating school fees and that they were going to investigate. They did investigation. They came back and said they found about 80% of the schools across this country guilty of hacking tuition and other related fees with no justification and that they will have these schools to refund the parents and the students the various in the unjustified hack. Now, when that the Liberian Senate voted in a resolution, voted to, to empower the Minister of Education to go enforce that decision. That decision will have benefited students and parents across this country and not just in Montreal County. Why is it not enforced? It became political. It became political because when students and parents started to benefit from reform from unjustified high intuition and other related school fees, and they start to ask, whose advocacy are we benefiting from? And it is said that it is Darrell Dillon's advocacy, then the politics of the day is that Darrell Dillon political scorecard or political morale will improve or, or will increase. I did not go to the Senate to make morale. I went to serve so that our service can benefit the people. Why is it not implemented? Simply because of politics. How many times do you in the media and the public hold this? We wrote the Liberian Senate and my letter was overwhelmingly voted for and accepted. We brought in CTN from the Freeport. The economic hardship being faced or imposed upon our business people that is in, impacting in a negative way the end users, our, our common people, ordinary people, grew our concern. We wrote the Senate, bringing the Senate's concern to this. CTN was brought before the Liberian Senate, and action was taken. The Liberian Senate resolved in a resolution and voted by majority of the Senate for CTN to 50% do reduction in its fees to reduce the cost of doing business at the port. Why is it not enforced? It's not going to benefit Darius Dillon alone. It's going to benefit not only people in Montreal. Any business that is doing business with the Freeport and doing business outside Montreal across the country will benefit. That's how you do representation. That's how your advocacy benefits the country and the people. Why are those things not enforced? Because of the politics. Why are they not enforced? Because you in the media, the people themselves, drop the ball. Because it will make this kind of advocacy, this kind of decision, everyday topical issue, and show pressure, and show righteous anger. Why are these things not being implemented for our benefit, for our common good? Trust me, these things will change. But when we raise this issue, the Senate take vote for the executive to implement it goes cold because of what? The politics. I have been advocating for us to empower the National Disaster Relief Agency. In other countries where systems work, when disaster takes place, the citizens do go seeking assistance from individual public officials' pockets. I'm not a good lawmaker because I'm able to buy one bottle of zinc for a citizen whose house got burned. I am not, and none of us is a good lawmaker because we able to purchase few bags of cement for a citizen whose house got wet away by sea erosion. We're not good lawmakers or public officials because we can individually help somebody with school fees. We are good lawmakers and good public officials when we work the system, empower the system, for the people to benefit through the system. So you have been there, the public is aware, one of my advocacy has been, let us by budgetary means empower the National Disaster Relief Agency so that when natural disaster take place, like sea erosion, flood disaster, rainstorm, fire, people can come knocking our door and we gave who we want to give and we have. The National, the National Disaster Relief Agency can move in to intervene. When that happens, 
the people start to appreciate the government through the system. Let's by budget empower this institution. And when we fail to do that, we are failing our people. All of these advocates we've made, the Senate voted upon them. How many times do these things get on the news? What gets on the news is that was Dylan sold 30,000, that was Dylan Law on his ticket, and that was Dylan and CPB, and that was Dylan and his bay fans. These are the things that get on the news. The thing that benefit the country and the people. Almost never make the news for whatever reason. And so in 2022, one of the things I'm seeking to renew is to engage my people directly because when they hear from me, even if they don't accept it or not, at least they heard from me. My regular engagement with my class, my people, every week on my Facebook podcast, I'm going to, 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 to renew that energy. And, 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 and to engage them so they know and hear from the houses more. Not everything I tell them, they accept, but at least they have heard it from me. Senator, what, was, what has been your, we stay in 2021, what has been your relationship with the executive, specifically uh, Mr. President George Floyd? Once I'm in relationship with the people that employ me, I'm in relationship with God, my family, I'm okay. Does that mean you the executive, the executive has de determined not to be friend of Daryl Dillon. And uh, I didn't go to be friend. Every time the executive sent something to the legislature, once it's in my view good for the country, I vote for it. I'm serving the country. I'm not serving President Weir. You work for the same government? We work for the same government. My role is to ensure check and balance. In doing check and balance, if you don't want to speak to me, fine. John, we are not shown leadership. Say he became president. He vindicated, he's childish, he's inept, and he's demonstrated it over and again. That is why I get away for 2023 to kick this gentleman out of the margin democratically. And we'll do so. You understand? I'm not going to bow down to George Weir as president. He's my friend, or if he still consider that we were friends, I'm okay with that. I personally made overture as an elected senator. I personally made overture. And just we are in his childishness, he said that it's okay. So I hold my ground. He holds his ground when he sent his bill. If it's good for the country, I don't see it as George Weir's bill. I see it as common good bill, common interest bill. I vote for it, or I make motion for it to pass. You follow the Senate. You see me vote several times on issues that President Weir sent to the Liberal Senate. Once in my view, it's good for the people in the country. I vote for it. I don't need to speak to him or him speak to me. We must just do our individual and respective job for the benefit of the country. For me, that matters most. If the president decides to be president and leader, he picks his phone today and says, Dylan, this is a new year. Happy New Year. Let's chat a new course. I'm prepared to do that. If he doesn't do so, I'm not going to make overtures as if to say, I'm serving at George Weah's pleasure. No, I'm not serving at his pleasure. George Weah, he called me my first time. The people voted me double. Maybe when he called me again, my entire time, the people will vote me quadruple. I'm not waiting for George Weah's speech. I will do my job in keeping with the interest of the people that elected me and the country. Finally, for 2021, uh, before we get into 2022, how far are we with this uh, country development initiative that your, initiative that your office took? And you, we've witnessed two occasions where you submitted a check to be used for the county through a council that was established. Are you still relating to that group? Are you still supporting the group? So that is why most times I get a little disappointed in especially the media as a whole because you in the media, you are also checked for some of these things. 
your institution or yourself, you were present when we dedicated the rehabilitation center. And I made a statement. That was September. And I made a statement publicly before all of the media. There was no media institution that was not present at the dedication ceremony of the rehab center. And I said, today, at this dedication ceremony, marks the end of my giving $3,000 back to the county council that I constituted because that $3,000 will be used to sustain, help sustain the rehabilitation center that we have put together to help to rehabilitate our people from drug, alcohol, or substance abuse, addiction, and mental health issues. You were there, and you're asking me what is that? Yeah, the public, but the viewers, some of the viewers, so you are, I know that I'm asking because they are asking yeah. where is uh, they don't own this. It's not because I don't know. I'm yeah, asking I can because they don't know. Yeah, so, and when you all, when you, when you, on your talk show or your this, anytime that comes, I'll say, hey, we follow this to this point at which you said, you will not redirect this money. It was public. It was not secret. I made it public with all the camera and the microphone in this country before my mouth. Right before the former vice president, Joseph Walker, the current vice president, Gwen Howard Taylor, the minister of justice, Musa Dean, the minister of youth and sports, uh, uh, Joga Wilson, an array of other public officials and the, and the community, including the international community, the day we dedicated the rehab center. Some of my colleagues from the Senate and the Mr. Benny Nigeria from AFP political leader have made that bold statement. And so when I hear people still asking, what is development you taking away a 3,000 is going to the rehab center. And that rehab center is something I am passionate about because if first, when we were giving the 3,000 to the county, we did, the, the county council decided to do some initiatives in some districts. For the first time since the new street market was constructed, for the first time after years, we redid, we renovated the market, the new street market right on New Street, right on Joy FM. And Joy FM as a media institution is our living testimony. Witness. We redid that market. The 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 sanitary condition facility at district number seven, South Beach. A bedroom. We modernized that place. We modern commerce and, and 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 we restructured the entire so that for public use. I live in district eleven. I don't use I have never used that place before. But we went there and we redid it. The council decided that many people go, they use the beach to you know to toilet to do other things because that public facility that I was there before probably I was born was never renovated. Yeah. We renovated with new commerce, new uh, uh, facility, everything. They went to district number seven, number 17, somewhere in Brewerville, and did a hand pump for the people in that community. They called the Corning Yard community in district number 17 with a representative. Um, uh, Hassan Kazuru. We they went to district number nine public facility, the biggest, in fact, they call it the Central Matari Mosque. The Central Matari Mosque, I think you were there, you, and when they did the dedication, four bathrooms, you know, those who are Muslims, you know, the religious uh, importance of a bathroom attached to a mosque. Hmm? They did a four bedroom bathroom and did come out and not pay latrine. They did come out and modernize that place. And it's not only being used by the mosque, but it's being used as a public facility. $3,000 every month. The county council utilized it. They went to Asma Street and did a whole uh, a water tower facility with uh, a water tower to pump water in that community. And a whole lot of other stuff. They did some renovation on a private public school in distant 30, in distant number one. So when people are asking for this 3,000, people have more interest in the 3,000 that I gave back personally 
Then they built for 5,000 that will save the country $4 million every year. If all this question was happening to your 3,000, if the question was what happened to Darius Dillon Bill, your pastor so we can save this country $4 million every year and put that $4 million in some sector that will grow the country or empower our people, dignify their lives, it would make sense. But yes, the people are justified too to ask for what happened to the 3,000. Because we have not been all over the place and explaining all of these interventions and development that we've been making with the 3,000, and people just thought that <laughs> it was not coming. But I just named places that the county council that we set up intervened. How much is 3,000? We did it so as to say if Dylan can do it, 102 other persons can do it. We can save the country $4 million or more every year, and we can put that money in other sectors that will benefit more people in the country. So, Senator, thank you. Let's jump into 2022. Uh, what are your prospects? What should uh, Mr. Rado expect from you more than you did last year that you expect to do more or some of it? Some of your thoughts last year that you expect that they should expect you to do. So in 2022, we are praying to God for guidance to order our step. Uh, there's a saying that a repeated mistake is no longer a mistake, it's a decision. A repeated mistake is no longer a mistake, it is a decision. You can keep making mistakes. Then I mistake, not decision. I don't want my human mistakes to come across as decision. Then I'm not a leader. Then I am worth the people vote. 2022, we'll look more to God to order our steps, knowing that we're human beings. And we want to return to the deal that the people voted for. And trust me, I can't wait. I will do it with caution. I will do it with humility. We will do it with care. But we will do it with courage and more robustness. We will do it with bold courage, relying on God for wisdom. The deal on the people knew, the hope that we raised. We can't afford to die, Jim. No, not at all. Not at all. The low movement we had in 2021 would not be carried over in 2022. Even if we have to stand alone on some actions and some decisions, we will do so. If we have to step on toes, but for the common good, we will do so. Because if we fail, if we deem the light, it will not only be deeming the light for ourselves, we will be heightening the chances of other Liberians who had genuine effort serving this country. We will be heightening the chances from serving this country. Because when we fail, or if we fail, another Liberian who genuine, genuinely wants to serve this country could lose that opportunity of serving because we will be used as a bad example or recommendation to say, they don't then talk in the time we gave them all the opportunity and the, and, and, and the trust and he failed. So you go say now, what are you going to do? You ain't no different. I don't want my service to be a bad recommendation that will hide another person who wants to genuinely serve this country. The opportunity to serve this country. So I'm going to be that dealer again and even a more robust, better dealer into 2022 going forward. So a more, a more robust <coughs> deal into 2022. Um, you have this issue now, we're going to bother our, our persons. You are from the Liberty Party. You are in Before you come to the Liberty Party, one of the things that that thinking lowering and diminishing our voice is this controversial 30,000. Thankfully, we all agree in the Senate and 
it is the wisdom of what we call the elders not to have rushed in concurring with the house on the passage of the national budget for 2022. So we use wisdom, appealing wisdom, and all of us agree not to rush the passage of the national budget for 2022 since we did not have the time. Upon our return, second working Monday, second Monday this January, we start to now review the national budget. And trust me, the budget hearing will not be because camera will be on. It will be because we mean it. The budget hearing is going to be interesting. We will tear that budget apart. We will make the case for sector institutions and vulnerable institutions. If I will have to have one set of explanation for this 30,000, and another senator or representative has his or her own interpretation or explanation, and another senator or representative has different explanation, that means that money is troubling, is controversial. I will not be part of it. I will not pass a budget giving JFK millions of dollars and when no bed is at JFK, then when I ask why no bed at JFK, and then my voice is diminished with shout out your total 30,000, not 30,000 who are bought bears at JFK. I will not pass a budget giving millions of dollars to fire service when there are fire issues someplace and I ask why no fire truck and somebody said shout out your total 30,000. I will, my voice would not be diminished on the order of 30,000. My people have cried, people have advised me, I have prayed, I have consulted my staff, I have discussed with my family, I have listened to the cries of the people that elected me, and this 30,000 would not sink or lower my voice in 2022 and going forward. If I will appeal to our colleagues for us to explain this 30,000, put into place a system that can track the usage for accounting purposes, for accountability purposes, if majority pass that budget, I will have nothing to do with that $30,000. And it is a commitment on January day before God and my family to myself, not to lower my voice, not to diminish the credibility and essence of my voice on the order of a $30,000 that far below, far beyond, more things that we can achieve outside the 30,000. Okay, so we, we also have this uh, accelerator and major deal that we have the, the Senate deal. Did not, did not We have well. rejected that deal already, not because we don't want the investment. The Senate? We have rejected that deal by legislative protocol. The legislature get no authority to amend doing ratification. You either say yes as it is and sign it for implementation, or you say no. Once you say you propose an amendment, it means you have said no. So the, the deal, the actual meter deal as it is, has been rejected by the legislature. All that fine-tuning with the amendment, we propose amendment can't hold because ratification of a document is a signed document between parties. Let the legislature is not a party to the document. Let me break it down. If you are attesting to a document, hmm, if you agree with what is in the document, you attest to it. If you don't agree, you say, I'm not attesting to this document until certain thing is in it. But you yourself can put that in it. Right? When you are attesting to something or witnessing a document, you witness that document, you sign it when you agree with everything in it. If you don't agree with any or something in it, you yourself can make changes to that document as a witness. You say, I'm not going to witness this document until this thing is added there or removed from there. Then the parties that put it there will go now and decide whether they still want you to witness it, then they will I don't remove why you don't want that or include why you want that and then they bring it back for you to witness it. 
It is what ratification is. Ratification is not an, is not the ordinary law making procedure or protocol. Ordinary law making protocol is what we call draft bill. It is draft. It is not approved. It is not signed. It is draft. So the legislature can remove something from there, be oppose something in it, or pass it as is. When you're doing ordinary or regular lawmaking. But when you do ratification of a document, it is a document that has already been signed by parties that agree to something. They only bring it to you to approve it so that it can be binding in case on our laws. Because it also has international uh, uh, nature or implication as well. Aslan Bita deal is a deal agreement between the company and the executive on behalf of the governor of Liberia. If the legislature does not agree with what is in it, the legislature notes what it doesn't agree with and send it back for Aslan Mita and the executive to go do new renegotiation. So as it is, in essence, we have rejected that, not because we don't want investment, but because we think there are things either to be subtracted or removed or things to be included. Then when they agree upon that and send it back to us, then we'll do the ratification as it is. It was good wisdom for us not to rush for the ratification in as much as we want the investment and we want any other investment that will help to grow our economy and provide job opportunity for our people. We will not just take anything. The last time you, you met uh, with the Justice Minister and the Finance Minister, you it was about Eton and Ibuma. Right. Where where are we on there? Have have we re ratified these these arguments or we still have them and it could turn us as a country in the future? So Senator Nyombi Kanga Lauren has persistently brought up the Eton and Ibuma deal on performance or to de ratify to nullify the deal since there is no performance. You can't have the legal instrument in, in all the country. The executive needed to tell us at the legislature, particularly the Senate, what are Ethan and Iboma were performing. Maybe Ethan and Iboma performing, and we don't know as a country. You understand? And one day we will wake up, and Ethan and Iboma come for payment on performing on those agreements. So the executive needed to tell us what are Ethan and Iboma are performing and if they are not performing and they will take the step to de ratify notify the deal on the basis of non-performance on part of Ethan and Iboma. And in the end, the week before we close, we had the Minister of Justice, who do you were at the Senate? We had a Minister of Justice and other relevant public officials who want to de-ratify because the Minister of Justice and the Executive have informed us that Ethan and Iboma are not performing, they have never performed. Did we as the government perform our side of the backing, like sovereign guarantees and other, other conditions for this financial institution, whatever they are to perform? Did we perform our side? Our government executive branch said yes. Why is it that Ethan is not performing? Let them give us formal notification or performance report. Anything short of that, we have to do notification of that deal and de rectify the agreement. Upon our return, we want to pick that up again to ensure. Because we don't want to be caught off balance here. Because if we don't do so, in the future, we, the current leaders of this country, whether we are still living or not, will be blamed in a negative way that we brought something upon this country. Nobody saw the impact, but the country, but we're paying for it. We cannot continue to impose on future generations. If you were at the hearing on the Aslo Mittal deal issue with the Minister of Justice, Fana, Lenzema, and NRC4, 
asked Senator Dillon on behalf of the people of Mondo Lado in particular and Liberia in general, I asked a question from the executive. In other countries, when you sourcing, when you selling out your resources, your natural resources, the leaders are visionary enough to set aside certain percentage share for future generations. They call it the sovereign, sovereign welfare fund or something. Money's percentage of your resources are deposit, deposited in some foreign account to benefit future generations. If you want to bomb mass today, the bombing hill, what would today they call bombing hole? Bomb mass company took all the iron ore from over there and left after there was no more iron ore. When they were extracting the iron ore, the generation there today was not born. The generation today born to nothing. But that's like that part of the country had natural resources that the leaders of at the time sold out with no vision and no consideration for the generation after them. The people are living very poor there today. I don't want to be a national leader today selling on all the national resources and natural resources of our country with no concern, visionary consideration that there are few generations coming after us. So I'm asking, can we even start with Ashton Mita to say, let's set aside a certain percentage of what we generate from selling out our natural resources to deposit in some foreign fund, trust fund for future generations? So, uh, <clears throat> Tonele, you, one of you were one of the lead barriers, if you ask the only that I know, on uh, advocating for this 5% oil. Correct. Uh, like in, uh, participation in the oil sector. Correct. Where are we? Uh, on the, is this sector now? Uh, do we have that 5% given back to Liberians in the law? So, in my view, it is not completely settled. We want to thank Amula Mame and the civil society team that took up this advocacy for almost two years or more. This is not a personal glory thing. Senator Jonathan Subwe and I decided to be their voices in the Senate to raise this issue because they were only advocating from our side. We decided to be their voices in the Senate. So it is not a, it is not a uh, political capital thing for me. I want to say thank you to Amula Mame and the team of civil society folk that kept this advocacy rolling. What we did at the Senate, I'm sure you in the media covered, we brought in all the stakeholders regarding this 5% from a 5% share for citizens of Liberia from the sale of oil. And to understand what a 5% was actually taken away. The explanation from this hearing, we concluded that the five percent was not intended was not actually taken away but the way the law was written anybody could conclude or it could be interpreted that it was taken away so if it was not intended to be taken away that it was not taken away it is easy to just redo the law so that it can be clearly understood without looking for interpretation anyway and one of the ways to show proof that the five percent for citizens of Liberia was not taken away and has not been taken away is to for the legislature to enact the law to determine the management of the money, the fund that will be generated through which trust fund, international trust fund, who will manage it, how it will be managed, how it will be deposited. Want that law? is enacted, then it would be a demonstration of the fact that the five percent has not been taken away. And it was one of those things that will also table pending our return 2022. And we we went back to work the second Monday in January this month and these are priority things that we're gonna pick up.
So let's not get into party politics. Yeah. The Labour Party of which you I are. I you couldn't wait. Yeah, of which you are a key member. Yeah. Uh, is in crisis, quote unquote. You have two chairmen. You have the political leader suspended by one of the chairmen. You have the another chairman suspended through the notification of a process that brought him to power. And because of this, uh, you are a member of a group of co uh, collaborating political parties, the CPD. People believe there's crisis and this thing that's going to go. And if it doesn't go, the party involved, like Liberty Party, the ANC, the Unity Party, are held responsible for not being, for not having their household order. As a key member, do you believe the crisis in the LP will hamper the success of the CPD? Muta Belete is not the chairman of Liberty Party, but party of the decision taken by the political leader back about the constitution. Um, we know we are in crisis. Leadership will play here. And trust me, this matter will be resolved. It will be resolved. Liberty Party will not die on the altar of the foolishness and motive, political motives of mutability. We gave him an opportunity to rebrand himself when the entire world was vilifying him, we burned our political capital. So, gave him an opportunity, a second chance opportunity. I'm a human being. I fell flat politically in this country. At a certain point, my believability level dropped very low in this country. My trustworthiness dropped very low in this country. It was a second chance given me by God first and the people of this country to believe me as the light to elect me overwhelmingly than any election in this country for the Liberian Senate to get me to where I am. A second chance opportunity. It gave Muta as a partisan a second chance opportunity. He blew it up. And Liberty Party will not die on the altar of Muta's recklessness and his political motive to wreck the opposition community. And trust me, everything that we have, everything that I am, will ensure the resolution of the crisis in Liberty Party. As we enter 2022, we will not be together in a collaboration where it appears that we have more opposition to ourselves than collaborating against a common front. What's happening to CPD is disappointing. Some people say, probably too, they don't order your brother's things upon yourself. We will take responsibility as well. I am tired shifting blames. Too much hope depend on what we do and how we do it. 2022 should be a completely different year. We are to nip it, hmm? nip it, resolve it, or part companies to, co to form new firms. I will not continue to be in any collaboration where we are more, we are behaving, we are acting as opposition, better opposition, unreasonable opposition to ourselves than the opposition that we're supposed to confront. So CPD issues will be resolved. We will not enter into 2022 and even approaching March with the CPD noise. No. Between now and March, we should give the Liberian people a renewal of hope. You have one of your members, uh, the ALP, that has mandated his executive committee to, I mean, summon to the executive committee to withdraw from the process. Now you have a Liberal mm -hmm. Party that is in crisis, um, to, us, to some extent, divided. Assuming you, you, you want to leave the marriage and, and form another front, which you just spoke about, you want to go into that 
ex-women or a rich man, half Liberty Party, no, another half or another side. The media gave an impression that Liberty Party is half. Mother Berede has a handful of people. Liberty Party tradition has not been to be in the public with our disagreements. If anybody thinks from 2004 up to the time councillor passed, or up to 2018, when we elected Nomdi Kanga Lawrence as our political leader. If anybody thinks when Bromskin, Councillor Bromskin, was political leader, vision bearer of the party, founding father of the party, if anybody thinks we did not have disagreements, if anybody thinks we did not have internal issues, then they need to think twice. But Liberty Party built a tradition for ourselves not to be in the public with our internal crisis. That is why it came across that we did not have issues and was one big mature party. That was maturity that caused us to be within regarding our internal issues. Musa, me, Gala, four, five, ten persons, and for national release in the name of Liberty Party National Executive Committee. And you in the media blow it up all of the time. Why you you cover his his nonsense the call convention? Why you don't make it live? Who over there? Why you didn't make it live? The way you always all in the public way. You see, I get it, I get a car, I get a Israeli committee. Where the Israeli committee? Who over there? How many? Why you don't go live to show that Musa Berete spent in Liberty Party? We made him chairman. And he was supposed to live to the norms. Musa criminally altered the constitution of Liberty Party. You in the media and some people in the public refuse to listen. Let me break it down. The convention of the party is the highest decision making body of the party. We went to Banga, we elected a new code of officer, we revised our constitution. And the constitution on the function of the political leader, the chairman, and other officers of the party were clear on what we voted upon. We voted that the political leader is the leader of the party, the chief representative, the chief spokesperson of the party. The political leader in consultation and collaboration with the National Executive Committee will formulate policies and procedures to implement decisions of the National Convention. Musa Belete criminally swapped the function. That means he altered the Constitution to say the National Executive Committee in consultation with the political leader will formulate policies and procedures to implement decisions of the National Convention. Let me simplify it. The Constitution says the President of Nigeria will nominate and with the consent of the Senate will appoint. That means the appointing power is vested in the President. Right? The Senate will either consent or reject by confirmation where applicable. Our constitution says it is the political leader, the standard bearer, if during election year, who will formulate policies and procedures in consultation with the National Executive Committee that will implement decisions of the National Executive of the National Convention. What were some of the decisions of the National Convention? Restructuring National Council leadership, the mode of payment of dues, the different different administrative running of the party it was the political leader that is vested with the authority to formulate those policies and procedures in consultation and collaboration with the national executive committee musa Belete criminally shifted and swapped the function into the national executive committee now it's just like you're switching or you're swapping the constitution to say the senate will nominate and with the advice or consent of the president will, come, will appoint. Now, when you do that, you are saying that it is the Senate that can do the appointment. The president can do confirmation. When you do the constitution of that, you have altered it. Once he did that, he did so with a motive. 
And once we were in house for months trying to get him to see reason to correct that nonsense, that criminal act, he decided that it's okay. That's how he came to the public after months. We went to Farmington. Musa confessed on his signature that the constitution that he submitted at the election commission was not the reflection a true decision of Banga Convention. The, the Farmington MOU carries the void is the exact reflection of Banga. That means the constitution deposited at the election commission by Musa was not the constitution of the Liberty Party and it needed to be withdrawn and it is reflected in the Farmington MOU. But you don't see the, the report I'm, from the NEC. The NEC, look, I didn't go far in school academically, but trust me, I can read with good comprehension. Go back and read the, the letter that came from the election commission. The election commission letter says, when a party official, recognized official, submits or deposits document with the election commission, that document or those documents are presumed to be the correct true document. If you, if you underscore the word presume, then it tells you there's room to prove that the document is actually not correct. The election commission communication said when party officials deposit document with election commission in the name of the party, election commission presumes that those documents are true and factual and correct until they can be properly challenged or amended. What do we do? We properly challenge it. We wrote the election commission through the political leader of the party to withdraw the altered constitution. Then Musa Belete wrote saying the constitution was not altered. So election commission cited the both parties to a hearing. That first hearing, election commission said, in order for us to make determination or a dispute, the, the regulation here is that you will, you will exhaust all of the internal party resolu conflict resolution mechanism. And if a party is still not satisfied, then you come to the election commission. But you in the media took that letter and said, Election Commission through the political leader letter outside. That was not true. Election Commission said, go back in keeping with the election regulation, election laws and regulation, go back and exhaust all of the internal party, internal conflict resolution mechanism. What did we do? We went back and we resolved through the National Advisory Council Committee of the party. That was internal party mechanism used to resolve this issue. We went to Farmington and MOU was derived from there. All of you saw photos all over the place that we have resolved this issue. The altered version of the constitution will be withdrawn so that we can deposit the true reflection of the Liberty Party constitution. The political leader attached the Farmington MOU resolving this issue and, 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 and inform the election commission we have exhausted the internal mechanism, the internal party mechanism. And so what, has, what was deposited here does not reflect the true version of the Liberty Party Constitution. So we are here about withdrawing the deposit, the corrected version. And the co-chair of Elections Commission, Tifla Reeves, on her own as co-chair, speaking for the commission, wrote a nonsense communication and said, that we had not done resolution of the internal party mechanism when the document were all deposited at NEC. Her failure to even ask our relevant officers at the election commission to inform herself caused her to embarrass the commission. How did she do so? The Supreme Court ruled and said, when a commission, a commissioner is speaking in the name for and on behalf of the commission, it must be signed by majority of the board. It's just that the Supreme Court, for a decision to come out of the Supreme Court, 
Il m'a dit, ça m'a tout mis mis three or more persons on the bench. The Supreme Court said, one commissioner cannot speak for the commission, cannot take a decision for and on behalf of the commission. It must be authorized and that document must be signed by majority, if not all. Tibla Reed did not sign as acting chair because the chair was part of the country. She signed on her own as co-chair. When you do that, we call under the practice of law, we call it reversible error. I think it was a calculated, deliberate, political, reversible error committed by Tibla Reed. And that is why we got our lawyers to put Tibla Reed and the commission on notice and record that they proceeded erroneously and they should reverse themselves because one commission cannot take a decision on for and on behalf of the board. It must be the decision of the board of commissioners signed by either all or majority of the board. So Tibla Reed letter was a complete waste of our time and nonsense. They did it to accommodate Musa Benete and the nonsense he had in Ganta calling a convention. So say that <coughs> 2022 against Let's say, uh, unless it's 12 months to 2023, this is the political year many have said, described it to be. Yeah. And you have these issues with, with your Liberty Party, by extension, the CPP. Are there hopes that uh, in the coming days? Yeah, there's hope. All is going to be solved yes. and you're going to have a CPP moving or you're going to have a splintered group from the CPP. There's hope. 2022 will not be the same as 2021. At least I am looking forward with my involvement and the wisdom of all of us involved. We're looking between now and March to put all of this behind us so as to move forward with a direction, with a clear goal and clear direction. Let me repeat, we cannot be in the same house and we're opposition to ourselves there. We cannot be under one umbrella for trying to be together, but we are more opposition, unreasonable, bitter, and, and, and against ourselves. We are missing the goal. The entire 2021 was all about CPB and the nonsense in CPB. Against John, we are reason to be singing junk music and all of this place here. We lost focus at CPP. We misdirected, we dashed the hope of our people, and I am also included one way or the other. I'm not going to, to shy away from it. We got to rekindle the hope of our people. There are people in the majority that don't want this gang over the country. We are killing their hope. Every time we hear Steve and one another under that umbrella, we call collaboration. If I must agree with Joseph Walker, it must be on policy issue. If I must disagree with, with comments, if I must disagree with Yuri or Nyombri, if I must disagree with any of us on that tent, it must be on policy issue. It must not be on petty and trivial issue. It must not be on based on make-up issues. We brought this thing upon ourselves and I am not excluded one way or the other. In 2022, we cannot afford to go into 2022 beyond March especially. And the reason I'm saying March because it is window in time enough for us to put our act together to rekindle the hope of our people. I am prepared to even be one of the sacrificial lambs, one of the persons who will sacrifice a lot, put a lot of energy, positive energy into this thing to see us go through. I will not be on a tent when we're fighting, but we're giving public perception or impression that we are together. That's nonsense. The people are tired of it. We are hurting the people. Somebody that is suffering today, the only hope they have is that 2023 coming. And every time we who they rely on to give them hope for 2023, when they see us behave the way we behave, they hurt them more. I support Joseph Walker. It does not mean I'm going to disrespect comments. Because I will take comments any day over George Will. Any day. Because if I support comments, it doesn't mean I should disrespect Boaca. And the reason I'm restricting it to two of them because it is two of them that, that are in competition for CPP's 
uh, 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 Standard Bearership. The right that Borka has to contest for CPP of Standard Bearership is the same right that Cummings has. If I support Borka, does not mean that I'm going to denigrate and disrespect Cummings. You support Cummings, there's no reason, rational, re rational, reasonable reason, for you to denigrate, disrespect Borka. Unless you are implying that if you support coming and coming in win, then you will not support Borka. Because I will not be insulting coming, denigrating him, or in the public with my audio and uh, uh, possibly Facebook posting that can be uh, kept for record. And tomorrow, if Cummings is on the ballot, then I say, hear that vote coming. Then they use my voice. Yeah, your voice. Yeah, what you talk about coming. Or yeah, your screenshot. Yeah, the negative thing you talk about coming. I'm not going to be in that league. We should grow up. We should be more mature. And we should be more understanding. Tolerant. You understand? So, if for us to build a CPP, cohesive CPP, all of us got to be tolerant and mature. Support your choice. Make the case for your choice. Don't disrespect, insult, and denigrate the other candidate. If that candidate wins, you could feel the need to support them. What will you be saying? You understand? So I'm looking up the march to play my role. Same with all, one way or the other, brought CPP to where it is. I have a responsibility and duty to, to help put it back together, and I believe that it's not late. And if we want to continue on a certain factor, I will also support the dissolution of CPP for us to form a coalition of the way or we reason together, we have a principle together, we have the same vision, we espouse on things together, we we'll ride together, we we'll disagree on policy issues and not the trivial issues. And not be denigrating of one another, disrespecting, insulting, and trap and killing the hopes of our people. So, after this, Senator, <clears throat> I would like you to close your remarks and enjoy this interview. Talk to your people from the point of the first day of 2022. 2022, I'm grateful to God for life, for my family, my wife, my children, my mother, my brothers, my sister, my uncles, my nephews, my nieces. I'm grateful to God. My office, the church, the religious community, my supporters. I am grateful to God. This is your Darius Dillon. This is the one you elected. I acknowledge my shortcoming and I'm committing to build upon them to be better, to do better. May 2022 be a happy year. May 2022 be a prosperous year. May 2022 be a peaceful year. May 2022 cause opposition, especially those of us at the legislature, to unite even more. And see the reason why we should vote as a block on especially critical national issues. When our people look to us with hope, let's do it for them. I don't want a 2022 where I want to play a lone ranger hero thing. I want a collaborative. I want a union. I want a team. I want to build block. But when necessary, if it requires being alone, trust me, we we'll stay alone. And may God order our steps and grant us the courage and wisdom and grace to carry through. Thank you to my friends in CDC, to my opposition, those who criticize me, you too continue to help. Because if I was only waiting for all and only princes, 
I will sleep even more, and I realize that I'm sleeping. So you're holding my feet to fire. Even my supporters who genuinely criticize me, even in the public, who are hurt, who bash me, rebuke me publicly. Trust me, I have a good place in my heart for you. Those who, for some reason, out of human anger and sentimental anger on the social media that I block, I will try as much from time to time to remove the block and tolerate your view. But you see, here's the thing. If I said it wrote bad, when you said it wrote good, then we'll have a discussion. If I said it wrote bad, you just shut out your tongue tie or your leg dry, then we'll have a discussion and leaving the issue. That way I can block some people. Then they say, oh, the man gets it. They're not tolerant. No. But I will lift the block on people as much as I can. I will use the almost the half of January to lift the block on people. Let's start a new. Let 2022, 2022 be a year of renewal for ourselves and our country. And let's listen to our people more because the place up there to serve them and not ourselves. Thank you, Kamo, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And I wish victory for Arsenal today. Again, <laughs> merci. <laughs> People say you put a horse in first. Why? Wow. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Yeah, no, I think I need to speak to that as we go. So, um, maybe I said it, I don't remember. But if anybody brings a video where I say I will never put my horse in first, eh, I will suspend myself for three months and give the, my entire three more money back to the county as a punishment. I said, I lived in this community for years with my people. They are my security. I did not need fence. I did not say I would never build fence if I see the need. I don't need to cry every day and say, I'm the most targeted politician, especially in Virginia, in the government. I'm the most talkable. I'm the most scrutinized. I'm the most targeted. I'm the most watched. You don't know what I go through. My community, nobody in this community has beat a cop in protest of this thing. In fact, take your camera, go in this community. The people telling me, thank you for the fence. It is the politician opposition to me that doesn't do about the fence. If anybody can bring a direct audio voice of Darrell Dillon where I said, I get fence in my yard before you let me, and one of senator, I will never be a fence. I will suspend myself for three months, and my three months money, I will give it back to the country. Oh, without saying you, without you, put you suspended. No, no. Or... Yeah, so it's suspending myself. <laughs> me, I don't want to take that thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a punishment for going against my own word. If anybody can bring a direct audience. But when I see all these things flying on social media, all the men are there, you will never be a fence. I said, all the time I live in this place, I was an ordinary person. And people were my security. Take your camera from here now. Go do something of use in this community without me being there. And let the people tell you for the friend. Let the community, the entire community went to vote. The entire area went to vote. I got more than 600 votes. And Thomas Father got zero. Zero. You know what it means? It means. Everybody in this community that went to vote voted for me, including Thomas Father, two full washer. That's how I live with my community people. So when I see all that thing on Facebook, what it meant, defense, and all that thing there. And this morning, the fence were open. People, the children came in. People came and played their band. And then we had our regular marriage, uh, uh, New Year tradition. We're in the yard with the fence. So the fence is there, but it's not from the people in my community, it's not from anybody. I'm going into a dangerous time when the government can do anything to me. I will secure myself while my community is also secure me with God above. So I felt better, but even better, me let it continue to roll it. In fact, I can't do improve it. <laughs> I can't do improve it. By the time I take it, I will plaster it and paint it so it can look decent. <laughs>